and try not to move. Steve's giving me directions in the back. Well, doesn't he do that, Armando? And then he's always pointing and telling us what to do all the time. It's because he's usually right, by the way. That's all right. Hey, good evening, guys. As we continue our, our study in Ephesians, missed last week, but I heard you guys had a great time. Um, you know, it's like uh, Armando's the Bible answer man, right? <laughs> <laughs> I did like Walter Martin. Remember Walter Martin? Yeah. This thing's got a life of its own. It's driving me crazy. No, I didn't. As long as it wasn't me. <laughs> so, hey, let's go to um, Ephesians chapter 4. We will do a quick review. Um, and before we jump into this, I, 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 I always ask for readers, so... If anyone wants to raise their hand and be a reader tonight, I would appreciate that. So if you could raise your hand, that would be great. I'm looking around. I know Judy always wants to read. So Judy, give me Romans uh, chapter 3, verses 10 through 18. Donna, and I got you at Galatians uh, 19 through 21. Uh, 5, 19 through 21. I got Armando, Romans 1, 18 through 32. Just kidding. That's a, we're going through that tonight. Ray, you raised your hand? Yeah, did you? Let's see if I got something for you. Oh, Colossians 3, 5 through 11. Any, any other victims? Okay, okay. Another brave soul, if, if we have more here. Um, you know what? Give me Romans 12, too. Any, anybody else? Okay. All right, well, we're going to go ahead and get started. Father, we ask that you would just bless your word. We look forward to this in Jesus' name. So uh, going back to our, our previous study of a couple of weeks ago, Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 16, uh, the emphasis in the preceding verses in chapter 4, Christ, and really taking a look at the highlights of Scripture, uh, walking worthy, walking worthy, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body, one Spirit, just as you are called, and one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all, through all, and in you all. To each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ, and gifts were given. And he gave himself some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, and from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. This is the body, and this is the body of Christ, and, and Paul builds on this really, really nicely. Emphasis around the gifts, but the gifts specifically for, for specific individuals that are actually leadership in church and their function is to build up the saints for the work of the ministry. And all of us have a ministry. You're going to have teachers, you're going to have pastors, and, and whatever that calling is, their purpose is to build all the saints up so that we all can serve, because we're all called to serve, every single one of us. And everybody has a part to play, and everybody's important. So now Paul is in these next verses and I'm kind of tight when well, I'm tight with this message off with the old and on with the new. He's going to bring it to an individual experience and really the responsibility of the believer. Because remember, the first three chapters of Ephesians was everything God has done for us. And now this is chapters four through six, the appropriate response of the believer. And so now we're diving right in it. Putting off the old man and putting on the new. And off of the old and on with the new. Let's read the scriptures, Ephesians chapter 4, 17 through 24. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk, in the futility of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling had given themselves over to lewdness to work all uncleanness with greediness. But you have not so learned Christ. 
But if indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus. I like that. As the truth is in Jesus. That you put off concerning your former conduct the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts and be renewed in the spirit of your mind that you put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Amen. So starting in verse 17a and b, this I say, therefore, in testifying the Lord, that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk. So remembering that Paul is actually what? The apostle to the Gentiles. Appropriate for him to say this. And again, he's also writing to whom? The church in Ephesus. This is a church of Gentiles, not a church of Jews, like, like Jerusalem would be. And he says now, testify in the Lord. Now that you are Christ, and that's, this is the most important part of this, is now that you are in Christ, you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk. We often say that sanctification is a process. We, we say this all the time, right? It's a process, sanctification. We're being sanctified. But it is also something that has already been accomplished for every believer. You are sanctified. 1 Corinthians 6.11 And this is what some of you were, but you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. And sanctified means to be separated, to set apart by God. And that is exactly what God has done for every single one of us in here. You know the Lord Jesus Christ. God has sanctified you. You are sanctified. You are set apart for God, specifically for his purposes. And sometimes we need to reflect really on our former selves. And what does it say? You should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk. No longer. But, but we need to go back and take a look at what that former self was before we were called by God. But also not, not necessarily just uh, who we once were, but also those who we identified with. Because we identify with a different group of people now, don't we? I mean, look where you're at. You're in church. Uh, it's, it's different now. I think one of the things, and Armando does this, and, and when you find yourself teaching, you share a bit about yourself and through your personal experiences and that kind of thing. And, and for, for me, one of the best things God did for me was actually, he actually moved me physically, geographically, from a place where I was, B.C., before Christ. And, and, I, uh, and I got saved in, in the San Luis Obispo County, and I was there for a couple years, but God literally picked me up and moved me from San Luis Obispo to Placer County, California, move, moving me up north. And as I got up into Placer County, you know the first thing I did when I got to Placer County, Rockland, California, I opened the yellow pages and I looked for a Calvary Chapel. It was the first thing I did. And I found Calvary Chapel Auburn and Pastor Greg Denham at the time. And, and for me, and especially for what I would call a two-year period, this extended period of time, it literally was just me and God. That's because my family wasn't there. I was completely removed. My family was pagan, right? Completely removed. And even my friends. And while I knew a couple people, ultimately what was happening is God was adding people to my life, but they were God's people. That's who he was adding to my life. And he was building this foundation. I didn't know this was what was going on. I had no idea that this is what God was doing. And, you know, he built a foundation. And, and, and really what the important part is because I was alone, my dependency was on him alone. I didn't have, I had the church, but that's still God, right? I had God's people, but that's still God. It was really an interesting time. It was a lone time, and at times a lonely time, a lonely time. I was going through a very difficult time in my life. And I remember, uh, so Pastor Jeff Jones, he's Calvary Chapel, Forest Hill, Calvary Chapel, for his pastor there. And he told me, and these are words that I hold on. He, he said, Skip, take, take your loneliness and, and make it time solitude with God. Go from loneliness 
to solitude with God. And I'll always remember those words because those words ca carried me through a difficult time. And, and maybe you too had a similar experience where God set you aside for a time because that's what he did to me. He literally set me aside and kind of isolated me. And maybe you had that experience. By the way, Moses and Paul had that experience. What did Moses do for 40 years? He was a shepherd all by himself with the creator. And even Paul, he, he spent like about 14 years isolated before he started his, his evangelism and his ministry. We don't talk about that often, but it's true. God set these men aside. And maybe you had that time too. I know he did for me for this one period of time. He set me aside, built this foundation, and, and built me up in the process. And you know what? I can now go, you know what? I still have a lot of friends and relationships from before Christ. The difference is, is I now know who I am in Christ. And I can be around anybody now because of the, this foundation that was laid a long, long time ago. You know, so that was really important. So we need to reflect on those things, who we once were and then how God brought us out of that. And then verses 17 again through 19. And this, before I jump into this, this, this is some of the almost bleakest scripture we'll, we'll hear. It is very, it's very bleak. It, it, it says, in the futility of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who being, and this is interesting, who being past feeling, they're literally past feeling, having given themselves over lewdness to work all uncleanness with greediness. Man, this is a harsh description for anybody that an individual, a person would be described as this, but this is what Paul is doing. No, this is what God is doing. Describing what? The unbeliever and the Gentile. That's who he's describing. And, and when I thought about this scripture, I, I, this, this thought occurred to me. You know, some of the nicest and the most honest and genuine people I know are non-believers. Seriously. Very beautiful people. Beautiful people. There's one lady, Arlene Chandler, when I was going to college, she ran the human development program. And nobody I know in my life had a bigger heart for little kids than Arlene Chandler. And she was training, raising up teachers to be preschool teachers. What a beautiful thing. She didn't know Jesus. And I can say, even my work associates, my current boss, boss Mark Crowley, so blessed with a boss that treats me so well. As a boss. I mean, he takes care of me. And I, I, I know... It's God using him to take care of me. I, I, have, I have this relationship with my boss because of God. He had, God has given me favor with this man. God does that, by the way. You know, he gives you favor with people, right? And so God, and, and these are non-believers. They're, they're really, really, really nice people. And yet some of the meanest and most judgmental people I have ever known in my life are Christians. Ever known in my life are believers. And I can say that without hesitation in my personal experience that more Christians have taken advantage of me and have personally attacked me than any non-Christian. Now, there are reasons for that. I'm in the ministry. And when you're in the ministry, when you teach, when you pastor, anytime you lead, you're going to be attacked. That just, Bob Mondo talked about this last week. In fact, when he's talking about it, I go, he must have read my notes, man, because almost every time we do stuff like this, it's like the same thing. And so you got all these really wonderful people, and then these people that we call Christians are like, they're mean as hornets. And how do, you, how do we reconcile that as Christians? I mean, really, how, how, does, how does this happen? Uh, and, and so how do I do that? Well, the key phrase here in this verse is what? Being alienated from the life of God. Being alienated from the life of God. Because that's who a believer is. They are alienated from the life of God. Because it is not about what we see or experience, but it's really about 
the inner man and what God sees in every human being. And in the case of a non-believer, the reference points for God, for any examination of the heart, is the holiness and knowledge of God, period. It isn't what we see in people. It isn't. The reference point is the holiness of God. And the non-believer has none of these. It has none of that. To God. And that for any goodness any man might have, what is it? It says filthy rags. Any goodness, it says filthy rags to God compared to the righteousness of God. And so what we are seeing here is the doctrine of spiritual depravity. This is, this, is, this is just scratching the surface of spiritual depravity. But that's what this is. This is the doctrine of spiritual depravity, that man apart from God is spiritually deprived by his very nature. By his very nature, he is what? Alienated from the life of God. right and they are completely in spite of what we see with our eyes they are completely and totally base in their nature their sinful nature the old man to the point to the point that the unbeliever does not will not and cannot seek after God who had Romans 3 10 through 18 As it is written, there are none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. There is no fear of God before their eyes. This is righteous condemnation. And Paul is giving us through these verses, these sentences, these words in Ephesians, he's giving us a point-by-point -point dissertation of the sinful nature. That's what he's doing here. Here he says, in the futility of their mind, which means translated vanity and uselessness. Their mind is vain. It is absolutely useless. Really, their minds are an utter waste. And then having their understanding darkened, it's translated, their understanding is their whole mind, their whole mind and intellect is darkened. It's dark. And then being alienated from the life of God. Remember, that was like the key verse here. Again, not only are they alienated from God, as we will find later, God gives them over to themselves. He literally will give them over to themselves. And then he says, because of the ignorance that is in them, translated for want of knowledge, for want of knowledge, the knowledge of God just does not exist in them. Because of the blindness of their heart, translated that blindness is hardness the hardness of the heart is a spiritual condition and then this is this this one gets me who being past feeling translated to what to put pain away what does that mean to put pain away and really what this is speaking to is the conscience of man our conscience our conscience and to put pain away is to have no conscience. And the spiritually depraved, they put this away. So what is 
to have a conscience. What, I mean, what does that mean? Well, first of all, our conscience is, is really the highest that we know. The highest that we know. And for the believer, what's the highest that we know? It's Jesus, right? That's a pretty high conscience. This is the holiness and the righteousness of God. We know this, but not for the non-believer, right? I mean, and, and, and by the way, he, he has said he's created man in his image, and even man, man has the law of God, but yet, yet, completely can, can sear the conscience. And we see this in people over time. Uh, Ray, and, Ray and I uh, talking about doing prison ministry. That's what you talk about when you're playing golf, prison ministry. I don't know why that's the subject, but that's what we talk about. But I, 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 had a, I had a couple tanks that I would serve in. Uh, my first one, uh, those they call 5150s, and these are the mental health guys. And as long as they were on their meds, it was fine. Okay, <laughs> just stay on your meds, and we'll talk about the Bible. And then, then for a very, very long period, almost 10 years, I was in what was called J-Tank. And, and J-Tank was where they put the uh, isolated people, protective custody. And this is where the sexual offenders would go and the snitches would go. That's where these guys would go. And, and sometimes you'd get somebody, a, a young man, who, who murdered his mother with a, a line and threw her in a, in a lake. He did that, right? You know, he, he went to a couple studies, and I heard later on he's passing under the doors telling people about Jesus, seriously. You know, these things happen. But... The point here isn't this part. It's when I went into this one tank, and, and my, I was in county jail, so I saw a different element of society. Pray, Ray was in prison. And when you look at, when you, when, you, when you sir, or see the institutionalized, the institutionalized, there's no conscience in these guys. I mean, I could tell the difference when I walked into that tank. This was a different group of people. And it was fearful for me personally. Because these guys were big, they were tattooed, and you know when you walked in there, they were hardened, hardened. And so was their conscience. And the conscience can be hardened. Think about the pathetic liar, the, pa the pathetic liar, pathic liar, sorry. That's also pathetic, but it's pathic liar. The pathic liar lies with no conscience. They just continue to lie and to lie and to lie. They don't even think about it. In fact, they lie so much that ultimately their lies become truth for them. This is the seared conscience. This is what? This is the past feeling. This is past feeling. And then, again, Ray and I in a golf cart. <laughs> you know, we, we golf with guys that are not believers. They use the Lord's name in vain constantly. It never stops. And the profanity that yeah, they, but it's more about using God's name in vain, you know, and GD and GC. It's just on. It never stops because why? They have no God conscience. They have no conscience towards God. They just don't. The world does not. That's what Paul's saying here. The world doesn't have this. Uh, by the way, I did. <laughs> Gerald Mar Marvel was one of the great preachers and. Church of God Anderson in Indiana, and I'm sure he's with the Lord now. He did say, say this at a, at a campfire uh, event. He, he, goes, he goes, you know, God, God and damn are both in the Bible, by the way. They're just not right next to each other, okay? They're just not right next to each other. But they've got no God conscience at all, and that's what this means, and that's why we're speaking to it. They're not feeling anymore. They just don't have it. And then they've given themselves over to lewdness, to work all cleanness and greediness. And, you know, this is the sinful nature acting out in behavior, this here, lewdness and cleanness and greediness. Now, by the way, not all unbelievers exhibit their sinful nature in this way. These are just some examples. But the one thing you know for sure is that they will, the non-believer, will exhibit sinful behavior because what? They're sinners. That's what sinners do. Sinners sin. And that's what he's talking about here. And by the way, this is just, just a sample. The list is large. We had Galatians 5, 19 through 21. I did. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, <clears throat> lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, dissensions, 
jealousy, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambition, contentions, heresies, envy, murder, drunkenness, revelry, and the like. As we have studied beforehand, this is why I also told you in time past that those who practice such things should not inherit the kingdom of God. So because for the spiritually depraved, the non-believer, you know, if it's not one thing, it, it, will, it will be another. This is a pretty exhaustive list of sin. But when I look at some non-believers, I don't see all of this, but there will be something. Because, again, their nature is sinful, inherently sinful. They are sinners, and they will sin. And then, ultimately, this sinful nature that we see be described here, and remember what we're talking about here. Don't forget this. We're talking about spiritual depravity, it's being spiritually depraved. And, and the greatest, the greatest exposition on this is found in Romans chapter 1. And go there, please. Let's go to Romans chapter 1. It's, it's, it's a lot of scripture. But as we examine spiritual depravity, this, this is the final statement on this, right? In Romans chapter 1, verse, verse 18. It's a lot. And, and I always I debated about whether I should read it, but it needs to be read. So we would understand the depth of this spiritual depravity. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness because what may be known of God is manifest in them. I said that earlier. For God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his individual attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because although they need, knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful. They became futile in their thoughts, that's what Paul said, and their foolish hearts were darkened. We talked about that too. Professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man, and birds and four-footed animals and creepy things. Listen to this. Therefore, God also gave them, God gave them up to uncleanness and their lusts of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves, who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worship and serve the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen, he says. Then listen to this again. For this reason... God gave them up to vile passions. For even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise, also men, leaving the natural use of women, burned in their lust for one another, men with men, committing what is shameful, and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error, which was due. It was due. And even though they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, listen to this again, God gave them over to a debased mind, a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting, being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness. They are whispers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things. This is the one that gets me. Disobedient to parents disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who knowing the righteousness judgment of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. Therefore, God gave them up to uncleanness. For this reason, God gave them up to vile passions. God gave them over to a debased mind. God has completely given them over to exactly what they want. He's given them over to this. And this is spiritual depravity. This is spiritual depravity. Verses 20 and 21. But you have not so learned Christ. Well, I'm glad that came in there. That was wearing me out. That's tough stuff. But you have not so learned Christ. If indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus. So you have not so learned. That's not us. Remember, this is the sinner. This is the unbeliever. This is not you. Never, never apply the scripture to the believer because it's not the believer. It's the spiritually depraved. It's the non-believer. 
and he says, you have not so learned. But there, there's, there's a catch here. If you indeed heard him and have taught by him. And the catch is, if indeed, that's it, if indeed. And the if indeed is this, do you know him? Because you cannot be hear him and you cannot be taught by him until you know him. That's the if here. You need to know Jesus. You need to know Jesus as the truth is in Jesus. Because the truth is not a thing, it is a person. And his name is Jesus. And God has given us this new nature, right? That, that what, we're not spiritually deprived. We are spiritually alive. And now we can learn from Christ. And we, we can learn from Christ. What? He will instruct us. He will lead us. He will keep us. And to walk, to do this, what? To walk and to live a life that is pleasing to God. That's the instruction he gives us. And as we learn, he actually tells us to learn from him. Matthew eleven twenty nine. 29. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Learn from Jesus and find rest for your soul. Verse 22. That you put off concerning your former conduct the old man which goes corrupt according to deceitful lusts. So it says to put off the old man. Put him off. What does it mean to put off? It means to put away. You, you put him away. And what are you putting away? That old man. That old man. He's a stinker, isn't he? Don't you just hate that guy? That thing just seems to pop up in our lives and rear his ugly head. It just, it, it's, like, it's like whack-a-mole. You know? He pops up his head and you just want to bap it down and Bap it down and bap it down because he always shows up. He always shows up. Just, and you want to tell him, just shut up. I don't want to talk to you. I don't listen to you. I'm sick of you. I hate when you do that. Whack that old man. Just knock him down. Just knock him down. We're to put him away. Kick him out and reject the old man completely. That's what he's telling us here. What? Concerning our former contact. Conduct. Our former conduct was that of what? A non-believer. The old man, the sinful nature, and the song we sang today. We are no longer who we used to be. We are no longer who we used to be. And not only that, the old man is not only corrupt, but listen to this, but continues to grow in corruption. Because unless the heart changes, things never get better, they only get worse. Things never get better, they only get worse. Robert Smith was a running back for the Minnesota Vikings, and he was a he was an addict. He was an addict, and and he said this. I remember I was just watching this interview, and he said this: unless an addict is delivered, the addiction only gets worse. It never gets better, and this is also true of the sinful nature in the old man. It never gets better. The corrupt continues to grow in corruption, and unless the heart changes. It never gets better, and it only gets worse. And only God can change a heart. Only God can stop this corruption. He's the only one who's able to do this. Who had Colossians 3, 5 through 11? Therefore, put to death whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but now you must rid yourself of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other, since you have taken off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of our Creator. Here there is no Greek or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and all of you. Amen. In all. Amen. Since you have put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man, who is renewed in the knowledge according to the image of him who created him. Verse 23. Boy, nice segue here. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind. To be renewed in the spirit of your mind is an active process. 
And it's something that we participate in. It doesn't just happen. It's something that we consciously and actively work towards, that our mind would re be renewed in the spirit. And how do we do this? It's an active engagement with God. That's what it is. It's an active engagement with God. And it's just not one thing. It's this. It's this. And, and we know this to be true. We almost always point to this. The reading and meditating on the word of God. I thought you start, we start there. But it doesn't stop there. Read and meditate on the word of God and do what? And also pray in the spirit. And then what else? Worshiping in spirit and in truth. And what else? The fellowship of the saints. One body, one spirit, right? And then from the scripture before, exercising our spiritual gifts. This is being spiritually renewed. Every time you do these things, you're renewing your mind and the spirit. It's all of these things. It's not one of these things. It's all of them. And, and if we're actively engaging with God, this is exactly what we'll be doing. Romans 12, 2. Amen. Verse 24. And that you put on the new man, which was created according to God, in true righteousness and holiness. Now, this new man, again, it's created by God. Put on the new man. That means off with the old and on the new. And to put on means to do what? To clothe or go into clothing. Literally to put it on, just like you would your clothes. We put them on, which was created according to God in what? True righteousness and holiness. The new man was created by God. And when we put on the new man, we're actually putting on Christ. That is what we're doing. We put on Christ. That is putting on the new man. He's the, he's the new Adam, isn't he? Not the old guy. Not the guy that took us to sin and death, but the guy that's given us life and godliness. The new Adam. Put on Jesus. And then who had Colossians 3, 12 through 17? I guess that would be me. <laughs> Colossians 3, 12 through 17. I love this. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering. Man, it's so easy to smile to read this. It was so difficult to smile before. There was nothing to smile about. I mean, we got something to smile about here. Put on this stuff, tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another and forgiving one another. And if anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. But above all these things, put on love. Put on love, which is the bond of perfection. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts to which you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell richly in you in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your heart. This is joyful. I mean, this is joyful. And whatever you do in word and deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father through him. Praise the Lord. This is beautiful. And, and I'd like this, and I'd like to share this with like the worship team. I don't know if you guys know this, but it says this, right? For you guys, it says teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. You know, when we sing, we're teaching. We're admonishing. We're building each other up in Christ. So as we conclude for this evening, Paul's telling us here, to put off that old man and then to put on that new guy. And that new person is the person of Jesus Christ. And remember, this is something we do. It's a conscious act. This, this doesn't happen by osmosis, right? This is a conscious act to put on Christ. And the world cannot do this. We've already discovered that, right? They only have a sinful nature. And they're sinners by their very nature. You know, sinners don't have a choice. They don't. They are spiritually depraved. But the believer now has the spirit of God and the nature of God. And yet we still have these things, right? 
my shoulder <laughs> and and my attitude and my anger and the things that I say that I wish I didn't say and these things are still there right in this flesh this old man he still rears his ugly head in my life and Paul got this too which is why he gave us Romans chapter 7 the things I want to do I don't do the things I don't want to do I do right I mean he 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 got that and, but Paul more than anything else also knew this that his ability to obey God would never be found in the law because when he when he speaks in Romans 7 the law is the backdrop the laws he knew the law couldn't save him he realized that and and not only that the law exasperates the old man Paul said, I wouldn't have known sin if it wasn't for the law. Wouldn't have known sin if it wasn't for the law. So if all that be true, Paul's going, what do I do? The law can't help me. I can't help me. What do I do? Oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Put on and let us clothe ourselves in Christ. Put them on. Wear Jesus, right? You know, always, almost inevitably, whenever I do a study, there's always a song. It's just in me. It just creeps out. And the song that came out when I finally finished this, the conclusion here was this. My hope is built on nothing less but Jesus' blood and righteousness, right? I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ, the solid rock, I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. Let's pray. Father, again, thanking you for your word. And you know, your truth is truth. It's not what we see, it's what you say, whether it's about the unbeliever or your people. And Father, help us just to rid ourselves of, of this old guy and, and put on Christ, that we would be clothed in you and represent you in this lost and dying world so much all through your Son, our Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ. Without him, we would not have life. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Let's all stand together. You are mighty. You are mighty. You are holy. You are holy. You are awesome. You are awesome. In your power. You have risen, you have risen, you have conquered, you have conquered, you have beaten, beat the power of death. you guys and we'll see you on friday <laughs> sunday whatever day you're here <laughs> monday for prayer all right god bless y'all
Short, 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 short